so today we're talking about how Chanel kissed goodbye to France and fully embraced the United Kingdom for tax reasons. So how did Chanel come about? How was it built? Well, Gabrielle Chanel, who was actually an orphan, um, I mean, she still had a father and she still had a, a sister, if I remember well, but the father seemed to be a, a single parent and he, he, did, he, he wasn't able to look after his daughters. So he placed them with, the, uh, with a very strict Catholic order I think the uh, the Carmelites, or the, the, probably the Carmelites, and so Gabrielle Chanel and her and sister went to live at a very early age with those sisters, um, and uh, I suppose that actually it quite influenced Gabrielle Chanel, you know, because she always had a very um, minimalist approach and using a lot of black and white, a bit like uh, the sisters' uh, uniforms and robes. So anyway, so Gabrielle Chanel, a French woman, uh, she was nicknamed Coco Chanel because she actually spent quite a lot of time singing and uh, performing in cabarets before she launched Chanel, the, the fashion brand. So she was also an entertainer, performer. And so she founded the Couture Maison Chanel in 1910 in Paris, in France. She was financially backed by her boyfriend, the Englishman Arthur Boy Capel, Boy being his nickname, um, via a loan to rent her company's offices at 21 Rue Cambon in Paris. So Rue Cambon is in the 8th district, which is a very plush and, um, and, and, um, and posh location. So right from the start, Chanel knew that she wanted to create something very uh, upmarket. So while initially the Chanel house was only selling hats at, at the time in, in the, um, you know, um, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, women still wore hats on a daily basis. So that was, there was quite a lot of money to be made in hats compared to now. So anyway, while initially the Chanel house was only selling hats, Coco Chanel quickly expanded into clothing when she opened her first shop in Deauville, France in 1912. So Deauville is a seaside resort in, on, in Normandy and it's really cute. It's a, a two hours away from Paris in train. And it's again, it's a very upmarket and snob look, location. In 1915, a second shop was opened in Biarritz, which is a, um, another French seaside resort town located in the southwest of France. Again, very uh, bourgeois, very upmarket. So at the end of the First World War, Gabrielle Chanel paid back Arthur Capel's loan and became financially independent. She opened a third shop at 31 Rue Cambon in the 8th district of Paris in 1918. So just the beginning of the Second World War. The 20s were, uh, sorry, the end of the uh, First World War. The 20s were a boom era for Chanel and several new boutiques, ateliers and offices were set up at 31 Rue Cambon in Paris and later at numbers 25, 27 and 23 Rue Cambon in Paris. So she really expanded big in the 20s. A boutique was also opened in Cannes, which is yet again a, a, a seaside resort town, but this time on the Southeast side of France, which is on the French Riviera, close to Nice, um, Cap d'Antim, etc. And so uh, the French perfumer Ernest Beau suggested to Coco Chanel to create her own perfume, number, 20, number five, which um, in 1921 was sold solely in Chanel's boutique. So this is really forward thinking because this woman was already doing the hats she was already doing the clothes and also all the swimming costumes that ladies were wearing on this, or, or this uh, seaside resort towns. And now she's thinking about making her a brand even more holistic by uh, providing them with perfume. And so, as I said, Chanel Numero 5 initially was only sold in Chanel's boutiques, but then because it was so successful, 
it also became available in uh, uh, selective distribution uh, network points in you know um, dedicated perfume retail shops which would uh, which would sell uh, Chanel uh, numero 5 bottles. And even today, the perfume Chanel numero 5 is one of the most sold perfumes in the world. In 1924, Gabriel Chanel met at the Longchamp horse racetracks, Pierre and Paul Wartimer, two powerful French Jewish brothers who owned the bourgeois perfumes and cosmetics, among other businesses. So, at the time, Bourgeois was mostly famous for his perfumes, but it also had and quickly expanded into cosmetics. And it, it was, so I'd say that the Bourgeois brand is more um, mass market, most definitely mass market compared to Chanel, which of course is luxuries, very, 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 very luxe. Um, but but um, I've often heard that the Chanel cosmetics are made from exactly the same products than the bourgeois cosmetics. So that's why also it's quite nice if you don't have a budget to buy Chanel to buy bourgeois cosmetics because they are made of the same primary products and bases. So uh, together, Pierre and Paul Chanel, uh, Pierre and Paul Wertheimer, apologies, and Coco Chanel created the company Parfum Chanel or Société des Parfums Chanel for the manufacturing of perfume parfum numéro 5, Chanel numéro 5, on the 16th of April 1924. This new business was financially backed by the Wartimer brothers and the shareholding of Parfum Chanel was owned at a stake of 10% by Gabriel Chanel. And that was in exchange for the transfer of ownership in a name, Coco Chanel, via license and also um, a 2% share in the annual income on the perfume sales. So she, she, she was to make around $1 million, um, for example, in 1947. Then uh, the rest of the shareholding of Parfum Chanel was owned at the stake of 70%, so 7-0, 70% by the Wartimers, who bore all financial risks in the uh, uh, Les Parfum Chanel, uh, 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 business venture, and then at a um, remaining stake of 20%, 20% by Théophile Bader, who was the founder of the Paris department store Galerie Lafayette, which still exists today, and who introduced first Coco Chanel to the Vartimers at the Longchamp uh, horse racetracks back in um, 1924. So in parallel, Miss Chanel started making makeup products, and in particular, a blood red lipstick from 1924 onwards. So this woman was so uh, forward thinking, you know, she was doing the clothes, the hats, the uh, um, accessories, the perfumes and the cosmetics. She understood it all. She was so uh, forward thinking. However, from 1928 onwards, Coco Chanel and the Wartimer brothers starting having some disagreements. Miss Chanel considered that the Wartimers were making money, I quote here, on her back and became vocal about it, publicly shaming the Wartimer brothers by calling them bandits, I quote here, bandits. She also snubbed the board meetings of Société des Parfums Chanel and consequently, in 1933, its shareholders decided to remove her from the management and board of a company. In 1934, she instructed a young lawyer, René de Chambrun, to defend her interests and renegotiate the 10% partnership she entered. But the lawyer-to-lawyer -lawyer negotiations failed, and the partnership percentages so 10% for Chanel, 70% for the Timers, and 20% for um, Théophile Bader. These pa partnership percentages remained as established in the original business deal among the Timers, Bader, and Chanel in 1924. Then the Second World War started, and Gabriel Chanel shamelessly collaborated with the Nazis and the Vichy government which was a collaborating government um, managed by Pétain, the Maréchal Pétain, 
she denounced the Watimer brothers as Jewish in order to attempt to gain full control over the Le Parfum Chanel business. Following the war declaration in 1939, Coco Chanel closed down her couture house in Paris, leaving only her perfumes boutiques opened. She went to live in the south of France, where she owned the beautiful villa La Pausa, but came back to Paris the following year, so in 1940. During the, the Second World War, the Vartimers fled to the United States. Gabrielle Chanel attracted the attention of the Fran French Mar Pétain collaborationist government on the fact that the bourgeois and Parfum Chanel companies had majority, majority shareholders who were Jewish, using the laws against Jews, and foreigners during the Vichy regime. But the Vertimer brothers had transferred the shareholding in Parfum Charnel and Bourgeois into the hands of a trusted and non-Jewish friend called Félix Amiot, who was acting as proxy. So Coco Chanel's attempt to take over the shareholding of all the other shareholders in Parfum Chanel failed. At the end of the Second World War, the Vatimers got their shareholding in Parfum Chanel and Bourgeois back. The war with Coco Chanel continued until 1948, when the parties settled their dispute by renegotiating the 1924 contract that had established Parfum Chanel. Gabrielle Chanel got her share in the turnover of Parfum Chanel in 1948, which was um, 400,000 US dollars in cash, so the wartime profits from the sales of, of the perfume uh, numero 5. She also got a 2% running royalty from the sales of number 5, the Parfumerie, and also a perpetual monthly stipend that paid all of her expenses. I remember I read a book about Coco, Coco Chanel, and due to her um, uh, ch childhood where she basically had nothing and she actually had to be placed in an institution uh, because her parents couldn't look after after uh, her and also uh, due to the fact that you know she liked she liked to live in style I mean she had the Villa Pausa she lived in the Ritz in Paris the Hotel the Ritz she rented all the top apartments of the Ritz uh, very close to Rue Cormon, where she had all her shops and ateliers. So she she was used to a, a luxury lifestyle. And also from early childhood, she she was, I think, quite scarred by the fact that um, she had nothing when she started. So I remember when I read this book, for her it was, a, a, and also during the war, she wasn't paid anything, the Second World War. So she basically had some debts. She really wanted to be secure financially. So I remember it was very important for her to make sure that all our monthly expenses would be covered. So, um, so that's what the Vartimers provided in this settlement agreement in 1948, among other things. So what would Gabrielle Chanel provide in exchange for this deal? Well, she sold to Parfum Chanel the full rights to her name, Coco Chanel. So it was no longer a license, which is a temporary uh, transfer of ownership in the... Um, in the of a copyright in the name Coco Chanel. This time it was an assignment, therefore a permanent and um, non uh, revert re re revertible transfer of uh, uh, copyright into her name Coco Chanel. So then she decided to sell the haute couture business to Les Sociétés uh, des Parfums Chanel in 1954 following her failed attempt to return into the fashion world post Second World War, while keeping its direction and management until her death in 1974. So why did uh, Coco Chanel fail her return to haute couture? Well, what happened is that she kind of missed the, um, uh, the trend of uh, having uh, the mini skirts. So a lot of women were going this sort of liberation phase in the 60s and 70s and uh, wanted to be able to wear skirts which would go above the knees, right? Which would be cut above the knees. Coco Chanel was strongly against this. She wanted um, skirts to be below the knees like before. 
she thought that um, basically if you wore skirts which were above the knees, like mini skirts, you just were acting like a whore. So she had some very, she became kind of quite, I think, stiff and, um, and resentful uh, because probably of all her troubles with um, Vitimer, but also probably it was also karma, you know, I mean, denouncing some Jewish people to try to take advantage of them during the Second World War was particularly low. And so I think she, she sort of lost the plot, really. Having said that, though, the Vitimers wanted her to uh, feel secure and also useful. So she basically still managed the haute couture business. Um, up until her death in 1971, but it was in dire straits when she when she she, she um, when she uh, died and um, and um, and someone had to be found to replace it. I it, it was basically on the verge of collapse, really. So the, the time has contacted Karl Lagerfeld to replace Coco Chanel, and they said to her, "Look, they said to him, look, just do whatever you want with it." Uh, because they were thinking, we don't really have much to lose, really. It's it's already uh, um, in, in dire straits. So Karl Lagerfeld can only do something better than what we have now. And at the end of the day, let's bear in mind that while the haute couture part of a business is always important for the prestige of a luxury brand, this is not where the money is. There are only 5,000 uh, clients worldwide who wear haute couture garments, okay? But everybody watches the um, fashion shows um, six times a year uh, that Chanel then stream, uh, streamlines broadly on, on, on uh, social uh, uh, media channels and, uh, and other distribution channels such as YouTube, etc. So haute couture is very important for the prestige of a brand, but usually it doesn't make much money. So anyway, uh, to replace her, Karl Lagerfeld became artistic director of Chanel in 1983 reinvigorating the dwindling haute couture business and creating its Prêt-à-Porter line. So Prêt-à-Porter is the more affordable um, clothes, clothing line that luxury brands um, create. Haute couture, as I said, 5,000 clients around the world wear haute couture. Why? Because a, uh, a dress would be 10, between 10,000 50 and and fifty thousand dollars that what would be the price of haute couture garment so of course prêt-à-porter which is still really you know lux luxurious um high-end uh but definitely nowhere the prices of um ten thousand to fifty thousand dollars so in 2019 when uh, mr lagerfield died Vir virginie viard who had uh worked with him in the, at the fashion house Chanel for over 30 years, became Chanel's new creative director. And she still is the creative director, Virginie Biard. She's in her 60s, so we'll see how it goes. Following this above-mentioned acquisition of the haute couture business by Parfum Chanel, the company took the new name Chanel Société Anonyme, so Chanel SA. That's the acronym, Chanel SA. And uh, it registered with the registrar of the uh, Nanterre Greff of a commercial court on 27th of August 1954. Okay, so it registered with the company's registrar, which was the one in Nanterre, in 1954. Um, on the same year, uh, there was a, the date of the reopening of a couture house, so at this time Coco Chanel was still alive, and the perfume boutique located at Rue Cambon was refurbished. The perfumer Henri Robert took over uh, the first man, uh, men's uh, perfume, Eau de Toilette, Pour Monsieur, is launched in 1955. And then there is a stream of new um, juices, of new perfumes which are launched and we are, which are very successful indeed. There, there's uh, uh, Egoist, which is launched in 1993. Then there's Allure in 1996. Then Coco Mademoiselle in 2001. And then Bleu Chanel in 2010. In 2014, uh, Jacques Polg's son, so Jacques Polg replaced uh, the perfumer Henri Robert as a new nose. And in 2019, Jacques Polg's son, Olivier Polg, actually joined him and succeeded, succeeded um, Jacques Polg, his father, as the Maison's perfumer in 2015 at the age of 40 years old. So 
Meanwhile, uh, while this uh, uh, basically restructuring around uh, perfumes was going on and the haute couture business was being acquired by um, uh, Société des Parfums Chanel. Meanwhile, Paul Vartimer died shortly after the Second World War, so around um, 19 in the, in the 50s, and his brother Pierre bought his stake in Bourgeois and Les Parfums Chanel. Following Pierre Vartimer's death in 1965, his only son, Jacques Vartimer, who was aged 56 years old at the time, took over the group's management. However, it was not a good fit, and Jacques was ousted in 1974 and replaced by his more capable son, Alain Vartimer. Alain's mother, Eliane Fischer, divorced from Jacques, with whom she had Alain and uh, his brother, Gérard, and um, she became a business lawyer working at the law firm of Samuel Pizarre in Paris. Mr. Pizarre and Ms. Fisher actively counseled Alain, so uh, Alain Fisher's son, when he took over the management of the group. And Chanel Essa in particular, in 1974, since Al Eliane Fisher founded the law firm Salons, now called Dentons, in 1974, 78, and she became the ongoing and long-standing private practice lawyer of Chanel. So Alain, with his brother Gérard Vatimer, became the owner of Chanel Société Anonyme, Chanel SA, also the bourgeois cosmetics and the hunting guns brand Holland and Holland, which was bought by Chanel SA in 1996, and other brands such as the swimming costume brand Eres, and uh, the book publishing house La Martinière, and also two winemaking chateaus in, uh, in um, the border region in Margot and uh, Saint-Emilion, respectively Chateau Rosan Segla and Chateau Canon. So they have a portfolio of luxury uh, brands, the Wertheimer brothers, but of course, the jewel of the crown is Chanel. On the 24th of December, 1998, Chanel Société Anonyme was transformed it transformed into Chanel Société par Action Simplifiée, so Chanel SAS as an acronym, which is a more flexible type of French companies that Société Anonyme. Also, there are much less uh, reporting requirements and uh, need to have all the uh, accounts, uh, you know, double checked by Commissaire au Compte, etc. So now that we've seen the corporate genesis of Chanel, we can no now delve into the more recent change in the corporate structure of the Chanel group, which definitely put the UK on the map post-Brexit. Alain Vartimer incorporated Chanel International BV in um, 1979 as the Netherlands-based financial, financial holding company controlling Chanel SA and around 90 Chanel subsidiaries. So a holding company is a company whose primary business is holding the controlling interest in the securities of other companies. A holding company does not usually produce goods or services itself. Its purpose is to own shares of other companies to form a corporate group. So as I said, in 1970, Nine, the financial holding company was based in the Netherlands, okay, called Chanel International BV. While the Chanel Group's corporate structure chart is extremely opaque, to say the least, um, I understand that Chanel International BV was still the fi ultimate financial holding company for the Chanel Group until recently. But this has changed and we're going to explain how. The Chanel Group is still privately held. This has not changed and it is still not listed on any stock market. The Dutch entity held the group's subsidiaries across the globe and consolidated its accounts. Chanel International BV's main subsidiaries were via a cloud of shell companies such as Moose Investments Limited, incorporated in the Cayman Islands. And these uh, subsidiaries, main subsidiaries of Chanel International BVs are 
Chanel SAS, so that's the French Société par Action uh, Simplifiée, which I mentioned before, a private company limited by shares incorporated in France on the 16th of April, 1924, and then later transformed into an SAS on the 24th of December, 1998, owned by a sole shareholder, which name is kept secret by both Chanel's management and the French authorities. The current president of Chanel SAS is Bruno Pavlovsky, and he, its uh, current managing director and chief financial officer is Luc Doni. So Chanel SAS, as I said, has one sole shareholder, which identity is completely removed from, for example, the French registrar's, company's registrar's, registrar's website, Infogref, or almost all information available from the net. However, my understanding is that the sole shareholder of Chanel SAS is a shell company based in the Luxembourg. Okay, so as Chanel SAS in France, and then you have the uh, um, whole, uh, the parent company of Chanel SAS, which is in the Luxembourg, and then the, this um, uh, Luxembourg parent company is wholly owned by Chanel International BV in the Netherlands. And then the other main subsidiary of Chanel International BV is Chanel Limited. This is a private company limited by shares incorporated in London, United Kingdom on the 6th of February, 1925, and renamed from Parfum Chanel Limited to Chanel Limited in November, 1957. It is wholly owned by Moose Investments Limited, which I mentioned before, which is its sole shareholder, and which current global executive chairman is Alain Wartimer. And um, oh, sorry, so, so Moose Investment Limited is, is sole shareholder and it's based in the Cayman Islands. Chanel Limited current global executive chairman is Alain Wartimer, and its current global CEO is Lina Nair. Lina Nair used to be a CEO of Unilever, also based in London. And uh, now she moved to um, uh, global uh, to um, sorry to Chanel. I think in two thousand earlier uh, this uh, last year in two thousand twenty two. One thing I wanted to say is that while um, Chanel Limited, the UK entity, used to be one of the main uh, subsidiaries of a Dutch holding financial holding company, Chanel. Um, International BV, the whole restructuring was actually to make Chanel Limited the parent company of uh, this Netherlands company, this Netherlands uh, 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 company, Chanel International BV. This was part of a restructuring, and we're going to explain now what's going on and what happened recently. So, as set out in the 2021 annual accounts of Chanel SAS, so a French company, the tax integration group in place in which Chanel SAS was also the parent company was terminated on the 1st of January 2021. A new tax integration group was set up from the 1st of January 2021 onwards, preserving Chanel SAS as its top company. So that is the structure in France and also with some smaller subsidiaries. It is set out in this 2021 annual accounts of Chanel SAS that according to the integration agreement, the parent company is the sole beneficiary of a corporate tax credit and additional contributions credits resulting from the application of a group's tax regime and is the sole company due to pay these taxes. The, company members, the company's member of the integration group are, however, jointly liable to pay these taxes within the limit of the amount which would be due by each one of them if they had not opted for the group's tax regime. So each company member of the integration group is liable to pay to Chanel SAS under its participating share of corporate tax owned by the latter, a sum equal to the corporate tax which would have been deducted from its app turnover if it had been taxed separately. So what I'm saying here is that now we have Chanel Limited, I'm going to come to this in a, in a moment, the UK entity, then we have um, Chanel International BV, the Dutch entity, 
Then we have the Luxembourg entity I mentioned before, which is wholly owned uh, by uh, uh, Chanel International BV. And then the under the um, Luxembourg entity, we have um, Chanel SS, the, uh, the, the, the French uh, parent company of all the tiny subsidiaries, okay? And they formed a, uh, a, a, an integrated group, an integration group under French tax law. It is also further set out in the 2021 annual accounts of Chanel SAS that the French tax administration conducted a tax control on its 2016, 2017, and 2018 tax years results, and that Chanel SAS had to pay some additional taxes to the French taxman for the 2016 tax year, while it was still disputing the outcome of the tax investigations from the 2017 and 2018 tax years. So what's going on here? Well, what is going on is that the French tax authorities, I should say as usual, are being very nosy and are basically um, doing some tax controls over the uh, integration group of uh, uh, Chanel SAS. And they're asking Chanel SAS and uh, its integration group to pay more income uh, uh, corporation tax and probably other taxes as well. Um, big companies like Chanel in, in France, they are, you know, controlled all the time by the taxman and becomes quite, uh, you know, nerve wracking after a little while. So apparently Chanel SAS is also disputing the outcome of this tax investigation for its 2017 and 2018 tax year, says the, its 2021 annual accounts. Finally, it is mentioned in the 2021 annual accounts of Chanel SAS that the UK-based company Chanel Limited is now the consolidating entity of the group, which Chanel SS is a party of as a subsidiary. So we've got all the little subsidiaries you know, everywhere in France and around the world at the basis, and we've got Chanel SS, which is the parent company of all these you know, tiny subsidiaries around 90 countries, etc., and they are part of the integration group, so some um, corporation tax has to be paid to the French taxman through that. And then above Chanel SS, we've got luxury, Luxembourg um, parent company. And then above that, we've got the Dutch BV, Chanel International BV. And then above the uh, Chanel International BV Dutch company, we have Chanel Limited, which is now the... Uh, basically the ultimate holding uh, uh, company and parent company. So indeed, in the 2021 annual accounts of Chanel Limited are set out the consolidated financial statements, which comprise the financial results for Chanel Limited and its subsidiaries, so including Chanel SAS, and I quote here, subsidiaries included in the consolidation are all, are all entities over which the group, i.e. Chanel Limited and its subsidiaries, exercise control. The group controls an entity when it is exposed or has rights to variable returns from its involvement with the entity and has the ability to affect those returns through its powers over the entity. The concept of control generally implies owning more than half of the voting rights of an entity, although that is not a requirement to demonstrate power over an entity. The existence and effect of potential voting rights that are exercisable or convertible are taken into account in the assessment of control, as top quoting. So then in the notes to the 2021 Consolidated Financial Statements of Chanel Limited, it is set out that as far as the ultimate parent company is concerned, the Consolidated Financial Statements of Chanel Limited and its subsidiaries represent the largest group in which the financial statement of Chanel Limited and its subsidiaries are consolidated and publicly available. Chanel Limited and its subsidiaries, immediate and ultimate parent company is Litor Limited, which has since been renamed Moose Investment Limited, the uh, company incorporated and registered in the Cayman Islands. So above Chanel Limited, there is Moose Investments Limited, which used to be called Litor Limited, right? Which I mentioned several times 
already and which is incorporated in the Cayman Islands. So what is this about? Hmm? You're asking yourself, what? And I'm, I was asking myself, what is that about? So why has Chanel shifted its group's control and financial power away from France and into the UK and ultimately some crown um, tax havens such as the Cayman Islands? Well, I think that truthfully, it's because France and its tax administration are too nosy and demanding uh, what with a constant tax investigations and controls over Chanel SAS and uh, the integration group, which imply that Chanel has to pay back taxes and penalties relating to its previous tax years results all the time. The UK post Brexit has become a tax haven where successful business groups and wealthy individuals can hide the exact shareholding of a holding companies and operating subsidiaries, as well as the exact ownership of their assets via a flurry of shell companies, usually incorporated in tax havens like the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man. Besides, the UK tax authorities are far less controlling and invasive than the French tax administration by a wide margin. <laughs> Believe you me, I know because our law firm spans between Paris and London. And yes, the um, UK tax authorities are much more lenient than the French tax authorities, which are uh, completely neurotic. By consolidating its accounts with its UK entity, Chanel Limited, and shielding its global consolid consolidated revenues in the UK, the Chanel business is ensuring that all its this French state's constant micromanagement is put to a halt. Additionally, the corporate tax rate is lower in the UK compared to France, and in its 2021 annual report, Chanel Limited set out that its effective tax rate had fallen from 28% the previous year to 25.70%. That's quite nice. 3% less, I mean, around 2%, uh, 2.30% less of um, taxes to pay. And that's pretty cool. Moreover, Chanel's management is spread between New York, where the chairman of um, Chanel Limited, Alain Vartimer, is located at the 40th, 40th floor of the Chanel Tower, located at 9 West 57th Street in New York. Then, um, there's New York for Alain Wertheimer, there's Colony in Switzerland for uh, Gérard Wertheimer, his brother, uh, who, who is more of a silent shareholder. I don't think he's very much involved in the business, Gérard. Um, in London, there's the new global CEO, uh, British citizen Lynn Lin Nair, he used to work for Unilever there, and also quite a lot of a flurry of, uh, of um, sort of VIP shareholders of um, uh, Chanel Limited, also based in, in the UK. And the only, um, the only board member who is based in Paris is, acto is actually Bruno pa Pavlovsky, the, um, the CEO of Chanel SAS, and is the only uh, French one. So uh, it makes sense for London, an English speaking place, to be the center of control of Chanel from now on due to its easy access by plane and train and its cosmopolitan culture when the management needs to meet up for board meetings which I'm pretty sure are all, all uh, uh, you know, done in English. So speaking of the board of Chanel Limited, in addition to Lynn and Air, Chanel has also named to its board entrepreneur, Martha Fox Lane, who served as digital advisor to David Cameron during his time as British prime minister, and who also sits in the House of Lords, and on Twitter's board, maybe not since uh, uh, Elon Musk came and took over Twitter, but she used to sit on the Twitter's board. Then there's also Alex Mahon, who chairs the British public broadcaster Channel 4 and has also joined the Channel Limited's board. So as I was saying, a flurry of VIP uh, board members have, have joined uh, the board of uh, the UK entity Chanel Limited, and they're all based in London. So this shift of power and control to London 
has been in the making for many years. After Brexit, in 2018, the Vartimer brothers started relocating some of Chanel's staff in the legal HR and finance divisions from New York to London into the head office of Chanel Limited, which is off Bond Street, if I remember well, uh, in London. So citing the need to simplify and rationalize the company's structure, as they said, a quote here, simplify and rationalize the company's structure. In September 2022, the long restructuring process was completed with the appointment of, of Alain Wartheimer as the head of the board of Chanel Limited, so he's the chairman of Chanel Limited, which has become the parent company of the group, controlling all of uh, Chanel's global subsidiaries and which financial results consolidate all of its accounts. A quote here, the decision to turn Chanel Limited into the operating holding common to all Chanel companies was taken in 2018 with the goal of simplifying and modernizing Chanel's administrative and legal organizations, as well as its decision center, which used to be New York. So, conclusion, the Netherlands-based financial holding, Chanel International BV, is today much less prominent. Uh, since all the financial interests are now concentrated into Chanel Limited, the operating company, as well as its sole shareholder. So Moose Investment Limited, so previously named Little Limited, the Cayman Island-based family holding company of the Timer, is at the very top, okay? Then it owns 100% of Chanel Limited, based in the UK, okay? And then you have um, Chanel UK Limited uh, uh, owns 100% of the Dutch-based Chanel International BV. Then Chanel International BV owns 100% of a shareholding into this Luxembourg company, which I mentioned before. And then the Luxembourg company owns 100% into the shareholding of Chanel SAS, which is the sole unique shareholder of uh, the French company Chanel SAS. Okay, so there's a flurry of, of shell companies going on everywhere. It's just super opaque. And that's exactly what the Wattama family wants. They don't want anybody to, you know, get nosy about their affairs. So, but I'm nosy. What can I do? You know, I'm a lawyer. I do research. I investigate. So the family office that manages the, that manages the Wattama stake in Chanel is called Moose Partners and is based in Bermuda, another British crown tax haven um, and territory. So both the Cayman Islands and Bermuda were listed on the European Union's list of fiscally uncooperative countries until 2020. Now they're off this list, okay? Uh, Bermuda and Cayman Islands. So in 2019, when the Cayman Islands were still on the EU's blacklist, Chanel Limited paid dividends of $1.6 billion to its parent company, Moose Investment Limited just for 2019. Can you believe this? They almost made $2 billion of our timers 